Okay, sweet. Los Angeles. I've never spoken in Los Angeles. I've, I've given talks from Hong Kong to San Francisco to Boston to Florida to Seattle, all over the world, but this is the first time I've ever given a talk in Los Angeles. How many uh, folks are Android developers here? Okay, great. Those of you who aren't Android developers, wh why you're out here tonight? What's exciting about this? Besides the free beer and pizza. <laughs> We went from a company of about 30 people to where we now have about 130 people. We have like 80 people in the engineering group and it's in a lot of ways it's organized chaos. It's kind of madness where when I first got there it was no big deal to not have any kind of engineering or science around how we built our product that would, it doesn't work at scale anymore. So the things that I emphasize when I talk to companies about making good build systems that are going to pump out high quality products are really two words and a couple weeks ago I was in Boston giving a talk at AndevCon and maybe had a couple too many beers the night before and I kept mixing up my words and I kept trying to say consistent and repeatable but I kept saying consistable instead. So I've invented a new word and it's called consistable and if you want a high quality build system you want to make sure that it's consistable and you want to make sure it's consistable to avoid this kind of problem. So a lot of when people I are trying to engineer consistable build systems in Android or really on any technology is Jenkins. Does anybody use Jenkins? Has anybody heard, how many people have heard of Jenkins and maybe haven't used it? Awesome. Okay. So Jenkins is a little more common than Vagrant. Vagrant's a little nerdy. Uh, but it's something you guys should definitely check out. Uh, Jenkins is based on Java. It's continuous integration software. It monitors the execution of your builds. And it makes it easy for anybody to make a build. So where I work and at companies I consult with, not only engineers use Jenkins. Uh, product managers, QA engineers, um, the, the receptionist, if, if she or he needed to make a build in a specific flavor, could use Jenkins. It's got a fairly easy to use web interface. Uh, anybody, any fans of Silicon Valley, the HBO show? Anybody watch that? Yeah, all right. So this is a, a screen capture from that show. They use Jenkins on the HBO show about Silicon Valley, so you know it's legit. And, and, and you should be like using it. you put it these together, like how do you communicate? So it's, it's like, this is like inception all of a sudden. You have your Mac, you, uh, you have your Vagrant container, so that's another computer inside of this computer. That container spins up a Docker instance, maybe several Docker instances, and your SSH, like three levels deep. How do you communicate between those different layers? Uh, this, this is how you do it. So if you're in Vagrant, so you're one level deep, and you go into this special folder, forward slash Vagrant, that maps up to the high quality computer. build system. So that's, how, that's the first of four kind of major topics we're going to talk about tonight in terms of high performance Android. So the next one is size matters. And this is an important one. That, that previous topic was fairly technical. Uh, it might have gone over some people's head. You might think, oh, I need to go you know, experiment with Jenkins and Vagrant uh, and Docker to really let that, that sink in. This is going to be a topic that's going to be immediately obvious and kind of show that even small changes, simple changes, can make enormous performance differences. But we'll just do this, see what we got. We got Google Maps and it's telling us that the launch time for Google Maps is 2.84 seconds. They've done some analysis, they basically download APKs from the Play Store and analyze them. You can see some version history here. Looks like Google Maps might be a customer of NimbleDroid who also provides consulting services. And they've reduced uh, from over three seconds down to now below three seconds uh, in between their last two versions. Uh, there are some different reports you can see. You can also compare this against other apps like WhatsApp, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. Looks like the winner is Instagram. That's down to two seconds. Um, you can see problem methods. Uh, you can see that they're obfuscating their code uh, from these. And uh, so I find NimbleDroid to be a really powerful tool when I'm trying to increase uh, the speed with which an app launches to give a better first impression to users so they don't abandon the game. Yeah. Um, so that's NimbleDroid.
Okay. Uh, and so that, that's first impressions. Uh, now we're going to get into some exciting stuff from Google and the tools that they, uh, uh, that they give us. I'm going to go kind of quick through this. Um, all right, these are the ones that we're going to talk about. View hierarchy profiling, profile GPU rendering, overdraw visualization, and a, a set of things that all involve SysTrace, memory monitor, and heap viewer, and allocation tracker. All high performance Android. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Mark. Uh, a little bit about me real quick. This is a little bit of the Android team that I work with. Uh, we, the four of us, we're all going to Boston and going to go to a Red Sox game. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you have any questions about any of the tools. Maybe a week, two weeks from now, you're working on a project at work and you get stuck on something. Uh, are all the speakers yet, but I know I'm on there. Um, so uh, look forward to that. And that's going to be a really awesome event. If you're looking for, like, if your company doesn't have a lot of resources but lets you do some kind of training event, you should check this out. This, this year it's all about performance. Like the theme is performance. And the speakers are as good, if not better, than going to Google I.O., which probably a lot of people in this room know is like, kind of like the, the uh, ultimate. So again, uh, let, follow me on Twitter. Let's continue the conversation. And I think that, that's it. That's high performance Android. I guess, if, do we, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, what about around uh, threading and task task handling uh, kind of uh, strategies for separating the views from your data layers, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah. Where, how, how far is it? I mean, I've got various feedback. It's like around using when to use uh, bound services versus net services or services at all within the app. I mean, when, what gates do you go through before you decide to use that? Uh, okay, so to abstract the question a little bit, the question's about different programming patterns and using different, um, uh, different features of the Android ecosystem. Uh, when do you go out of your way to change the pattern you're using to achieve higher performance? And I, I think the answer is, if you're following the direction of this talk, then you will be using the tools uh, in, the in the Android tools section, and you'll see a problem. You'll see an obvious, like some jank, something that's taking longer than 16 milliseconds to draw, maybe because there's a, a synchronous request to a database, uh, which, which you can do in Android still. Uh, and then at that point, you might re-architect the way you're doing database requests. Um, and, and put those into an offline service, or, or an asynchronous service, rather. Um, I think a, a kind of like boilerplate answer to that question is, if you know there's a high performance pattern available, you should, the right time to use it is from the start. So it's obviously a lot more expensive to implement new patterns once you have a large code base than it is from the very beginning. But there's, a, there's kind of a balancing act. Like you want to ship something so you can get users, but you want your users to have an excellent experience, so you want to write excellent code. But sometimes it takes longer to write excellent code. Um, but in the long run, you're probably better off starting from the beginning. Yeah? I didn't quite got the connection between background and Docker with Android. How yeah. Are you using, uh, using those two? Green like emulators like phones or how are you using background and Docker? Yeah, in your good question. So the the question was uh, w essentially what is the relationship between Vagrant, Docker, and Jenkins to high performance Android? Um, and the answer is that all three of those tools are ways to create consistible build systems. And build systems are an important part of providing a high performance experience to your users because they can help reduce the number of escape defects you have or essentially bugs that get out into the wild. Um, it, a lot of times when you do have an escape defect or a bug that a user experiences, it's because an engineer didn't experience it locally 
or didn't have one of the unit tests or integration tests that I mentioned around that feature. Uh, so that whole section of the talk, the first quarter of the talk, was all about how do we make sure that the APK that we ship to the Play Store has the smallest number of defects in it. Yeah, so the, the question was, how do you manage uh, testing around different versions of, in, in this case it was Android operating versions, but you could abstract the question a little bit to also include all kinds of different shapes and sizes, different memory profiles of devices from a five-year-old gingerbread device to you know the upcoming uh, Nexus 5 2015. Uh, uh, the short answer is with a lot of work. Um, some of the most creative solutions to dealing with that involve tools like Spoon is a popular one that Square has put out. Uh, Spoon allows you to run unit tests on multiple different emulators uh, and also you can actually connect them to physical devices. So what I'm seeing a lot of companies doing now is using tools like the Amazon Cloud Lab that I mentioned and running their tests, their integration tests on every single flavor of Android. Which there, you know, in a sense there's a lot of them, but if, if you just do like one that's running Android Marshmallow, you know, Jelly Bean, Kit Kat, Lollipop, you know, one for each of the major versions, uh, you're probably going to find most of the, mo any problem that's specific to a certain device. A lot of companies, uh, the other thing you can do is end-of-life support for older Android operating systems. Uh, a lot of companies have thresholds. Uh, every month Google will publish how many users are in each Android operating system. Uh, and I'll probably pull that up. And then once you get below a certain threshold, you just stop supporting. Um, There we go. So here you can see that you know API 10 Gingerbread is only on 4.6 percent of devices. Maybe you probably want to support 5 percent of overall global Android users, but you might not care as much about 0.3 percent. So one trick is to stop testing API level 8, you know, and just don't support Froyo, frozen yogurt. So that's another trick. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Un so the question is, uh, on Android, how do you get high performance video rendering that uh, you see on iOS? that maybe you don't always see even on pretty expensive Android devices. Uh, unfortunately, so video uh, compression and performance is a pretty specialized uh, skill set and I, I don't do a lot of work with video so I, I don't have any great tips on that. I, I do know that the iOS engineers do have it easier. Uh, there are less devices and the hardware is very high quality in all cases. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you, unfortunately. I, I know a lot of companies struggle with that, that, that have video. Um, I know like the Periscope and Meerkat engineers, for example, shipping Android was much more difficult than it was on iOS, be it's specifically because that's such a tough nut to crack. Um, so, yeah, follow up. I didn't, I'm not sure I heard the whole question. It was about material design and fallback. You mean like the compatibility package? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean the compatibility package has been a, a gift from the Android team. 
that allows you to backport some of the newer UI tricks that are available on the newest devices to older devices. Um, and it's gotten better over time. It, it ha doesn't support you know, all the way back and it doesn't support every single feature, you know, but they add more as time goes on. And I, a lot of credit goes to uh, Action Bar Sherlock, which was an open source project from Jake Wharton that really, I feel like, motivated Google to do the compatibility package. Um, it, it, once they released the compatibility package, it wasn't necessary anymore to use Action Bar Sherlock. But Action Bar Sherlock was the original way you could backport the Action Bar, which was a new UI feature, I want to say an ice cream sandwich. Uh, and it let you go all the way back to frozen yogurt or gingerbread and have that support. And he kind of demonstrated that that was possible. Google should be offering these tools to developers and within a couple versions, a couple years, they added the compatibility package. Um. Inception, there it is again. Yeah. Yeah. In the context of performance, yeah. um, where do you see Android in five years? Take into account that uh, hardware devices are becoming more oh, capable. Yeah. Uh, they're gonna be cars, TVs, and stuff like that. That's a fun question. We'll end on that because that's good food for thought. And I'll be around to take more questions. So the question is, uh, in the context of performance, where do you see Android devices being in five years? Um, an interesting way to think about that is to go back five years. Think about the phone you had five years ago. I was thinking about this in the airport the other day. Anybody here know what WAP is? W-A-P? It was Wireless Access Protocol. I used to have this phone that it kind of like worked on beeper technology, I think, and I would surf the internet, all text, uh, on my phone, and it would cost a fortune uh, over WAP. And that was not, that was more than five years ago. That was 10 plus years ago. But uh, things have come a long way. And you think five years ago, there weren't smart watches, there weren't wearables you put on your face. Um, the screen sizes were way smaller. I think five years from now, you'll see, Ant like I'm right now I have, you know, let's say I was wearing Google Glass, I have three Android devices on me right now. I have my phone, or my phone, my watch, and Google Glass. I happen to have a tablet in my bag as well, so if I was holding it, I have four devices. I think in five years I could have 25 devices on. My shirt, my, my elbow joint, my knees, my, my sneakers will probably all have, not, not literally my joint, what I mean by that is in the clothing around my joint, uh, will be sensors and it will tell me things like, hey, your posture's bad, like stand up. Or, uh, you know, more detailed fitness data will be available. I'm a big, I'm from Colorado, I'm a big uh, snowboarder and I can't wait. Like I used to teach kids how to snowboard and you talk about all these kind of difficult to comprehend concepts like ankle flexion like how much you flex your ankles is very important in snowboarding and it'd be amazing if I had 10 Android devices uh, on my ankles that could measure my flexion and tell me in an S curve, like I could look at a playback after I did a run, it would say, you know, at the top of the run your flexion was great, but it looks like you need to hit the gym because at the bottom of the run you must have gotten tired and you weren't flexing enough. So I think the short answer is everywhere. Where do I see devices? I see them everywhere. Um, they're going to be really cheap. That's the other thing. Phones used to be so expensive and they're so cheap now, relatively. And, and just, I think about computers, like, it's insane that, like, I used to have a $5,000 computer. Like, I don't even know how to spend $5,000 on a computer anymore, basically. Like, you'd have, and, and that was like $5,000 for a run-of-the-mill computer. That was like the average computer. Um, so I think they'll be everywhere and they'll be in formats that, you know, with the home automation push that Google is doing right now, if that takes off, like, will also be in your environment. Like when I walk into my house, there'll be another hundred different Android devices. My stereo, my refrigerator, my washing machine. Already your thermostat can tell you when it's turning on and turning off. Uh, so that's a, that was a good question. Thanks. That's fun. So that's it. Let's hang out. Let's play with Movario. And Thank you. Do we have some gifts for you? Oh, oh thank you. Oh, thank you. Awesome. And then let me also get a wheel. Oops. Yeah.